My name is Theoharis Grigoriadis. I'm an assistant professor for economics at the Osto Europa Institute. It is a great pleasure for me, for us, for the Free University, and of course for the Osto Europa Institute to welcome here Professor Mark Harrison of the University of Warwick. Uh, professor Harrison has completed his undergraduate and graduate work at Oxford University at Clare College and St. Anthony's College. He is one of the world's authoritative historians of the Soviet economic system. He has written authoritative works on the Stalinist economic system, on, on the origins of central planning in the Soviet Union, on the defense, industry, and military planning before the World War II. He is an expert, a leading expert, on the economics of World War II. And he has been co-directing for many, many years the Hoover uh, workshop on totalitarian regimes. He ha his research has been um, uh, awarded uh, by, a, uh, by numerous uh, academic uh, and scholarly uh, and learned societies, including the British Association for Slavonic and East European Studies, if I'm not mistaken, also the Russian Academy of Sciences. Um, and Professor Harrison is indeed um, one of the world's leading scholars on the economic history of the Soviet Union. Professor Harrison, welcome to Berlin, welcome to the Freie Universität, and we look forward to your talk. Well, uh, thank you very much. I'm very grateful for the invitation, and it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm going to begin by showing you the story of the Soviet economy between the two world wars in three pictures. So this is the first picture. It shows a Soviet national income per head from 1913 to 1940. And it shows also the main phases of development of uh, the Soviet uh, economic system under Stalin. So you have 1914 to 1917, before the revolution, the Russian economy in World War I. You can see a decline. It looks bad. Oh, I should have said, the scale here is logarithmic. That's so that we can focus particularly on what happens when things are bad. You can see the decline during World War I. That looks bad. But you shouldn't get too excited. This was happening everywhere in Europe. When you look at Germany, Austria, Hungary, the Balkans, Turkey. This decline is typical. With the revolution, there's a sudden collapse. Uh, to 1921. So this is the period of the revolution and the civil war. Then there's a recovery, which takes us through the period of the new economic policy to 1929. We're still slightly below this level. And then there's a period of Stalin's industrialization and five-year plans, which takes us to 1940. So I'm going to, you're going to see this chart again. You needn't worry if it disappears from your screen because it's going to come back. But I'm going to use this chart to talk about these different periods and the emergence and nature of Stalin's economic system. This is the first picture. Here's the second picture. The increase in the supply of things between 1913 and 1940. Again, the scale is logarithmic. So you can see this as dividing uh, selection of things into uh, uh, different categories. So the first category is the number of, is the things that increased in volume between one and ten times. So you start with grain, which barely increased at all, textiles, you know, paper, cement, steel, all of these things showing greater and greater increases. Then you get a few things that increase between ten and a hundred times. Electric power, mineral fertilizer, and then finally you get motor vehicles, which is an example of a complex machine, very few of which were produced in 1913, which increased, in fact, more than a thousand times between 1913 and 1940. So that tells you that while the production of things grew in general, 
the structure of production also changed dramatically away from things like grain and textiles to more complicated, metal-intensive things. Now, during the Cold War, most uh, Western economists who wrote about these processes followed a, a shared perspective, which you can describe as thinking about the Soviet Union as a kind of civilian developmental state. So they were interested in economic growth, in what happened to living standards, and the sort of things that you'd want to write about if you thought of the Soviet Union as primarily a civilian project. So they described an economy that pursued economic growth using methods that were perhaps uh, rather authoritarian or paternalistic, in which the acquisition of uh, secret police and nuclear weapons was kind of incidental. And such a perspective might be explained by the fact that non-civilian things were extremely secret throughout the period of the Cold War. But it also flew in the face of things that people who weren't economists knew very well. Historians, for example. <laughs> and just to illustrate what I mean, I'm going to show you the third picture, which you've already seen, in fact. This is the front page of Pravda on the 1st of January, 1937. This is the party's uh, New Year greetings to the people. You can see Stalin, smiling. You can see Lenin, now dead, but still smiling. You can see the happy workers. And the reason that all these people are smiling is because of the very large numbers of tanks and planes that are flying over Red Square. So it doesn't seem that this project is just about civilian economic development, does it? When you look at this. Tanks and planes for the military clearly had a place in this scheme of things. Of course, one question you might ask is, this is just a picture. Did these planes really exist, or was, it, was the image just for propaganda? And the answer is no, because this is a graphical representation of something that happened just a month or two before. Uh, this is the same planes, see the, these big four-engine, the world's first four-engine bomber flying over Red Square on Revolution Day 1936. Here's another way of thinking about those planes. So, how many of these planes were there really? Well, here's combat aircraft produced around the world in 1939 by Japan, the UK, Italy, Germany, USA, USSR. Uh, the only country that I think is missing from this table, I wasn't able to f fill it in in the time that I had, was, is, I think is France. So if you think about these numbers, Japan, 700, the UK, Italy, Germany, to so one, 2,000, USA, but this is a larger number than just combat aircraft, this is all, all aircraft. And here's the Soviet Union, nearly 7,000 combat aircraft produced in 1939. In other words, nearly as much as in the rest of the world put together. So those are my three pictures. They show that the Soviet Union's, the Soviet economy's mobilization capacity supported a power status that was far above that country's economic rank. And it's easy to establish that, in fact, when Soviet leaders talked about their goals in public, they never forgot to mention the importance of relative military and economic power uh, as one of the most important things that the economy was intended to supply. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to talk you through something that is loosely based on a chapter that I wrote for the Cambridge Economic History of Communism. It's not out yet, but there's a preprint available on my web pages. So we're going to look at the world's first command economy. I'm going to say a few words about where this idea came from. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the problem of state capacity, the reason being that a command economy makes huge demands on the capacities of the state. And then I'll talk to you about the emergence of the Stalinist economic system as a product of two things. One is the narrative which you can find in any textbook, and it's a tortuous, winding tale 
of events and advances and setbacks and so on. But there's also a background story, which is a much simpler, linear story of methodical, incremental building of state capacity. And that's essentially, I'm going to try and tell you both those stories at once. And then if I have time, I'll just say a few words about the legacy that Stalin left to his successors. So, what's a command system? I think the, um, the best short definition is still that provided by Oskar Langer, the Polish Marxist economist, in a lecture in 1957. Here are the things that define an economy of the Soviet type, he said. The concentration of resources towards one basic objective, Centralization. Why centralization? To prevent leakages, to prevent resources from going away from that one basic objective. Administration. Resources are driven by administrative decisions, not by a market. And then finally, the use of political incentives and patriotism to stimulate effort. So that was the idea, but where did it come from? Lots of history textbooks begin by saying, well, it didn't come from Marx, which leaves it a bit of a mystery. But the mystery, there is no mystery, really. It's, we just have to remember the historical context of the October Revolution, which was the First World War. The experience of living through World War I gave lots of people the idea of a command economy. So, if you think of what drove economies across Europe in World War I, first of all, there was one basic objective. That is the objective of fighting and winning uh, a total war. The second thing was the importance of preventing leakages, because if the war, winning the war was the goal, it was vitally important that civilians did not squander resources on unnecessary things. Of course, you still have to allow people uh, to be entertained in wartime, you have to do things with their morale, you have to allow basic consumption, but everything beyond that must be, uh, must be put into the war effort and therefore it's important to prevent leakages. The importance, the war also showed the importance of administratively driven priorities because by the end of the war, most economies were being run by some, to some degree or other by committee. Not by markets, but by committees. And then finally, it almost goes almost without saying that patriotic appeals were extremely important in wartime in motivating people. They weren't always enough. Patriotic appeals were often not enough. And then that raised the question, well, once you've exhausted people's willingness to fight for the national cause, what then? What, what incentives do you apply when patriotic appeals fail? So, in wartime we see that across Europe every government took some kind of steps to convert war needs into commands. And here I have a very simple meaning of the word command to suggest to you, which is a command is an offer that you can't refuse. You can't refuse it well, you could refuse it, but if you do, there will be unpleasant consequences. And the nature of command is that it offers you a bad choice. It says to you, you know, um, if you don't go along with what the government wants, things will be bad. So that's the nature of a command. But the command economy, in turn, placed tremendous burdens on the state because the state then had to regulate not only the market for weapons, for example, but also the markets for all the things that go into making weapons. The metals, the fuels, the machinery, the imports, uh, the labour. So from final products all the way back to the raw materials and the labour that go into making the things that you need to throw into the war. The government had to regulate all these things and at each stage prevent those leakages prevent the leakages that would allow war materials to go to unauthorised uses. So, the command economy across Europe, where countries tried to convert their economies to supporting the war effort, every country developed business committees, 
committees of industrialists who sat in a room and decided who is going to get the intermediate goods and who will be denied them, to decide where labour is going to be uh, employed, in the army or in the arms factories, to assign public funds for new war factories, and to licence credit and foreign exchange and shipping space and all those other things that go into uh, making things. But business committees, that's just one side of things. The other thing that came into being across Europe was food committees, because the workers and the soldiers had to be fed. And food committees were active in every country in trying to fix price caps for food, maximum prices, and also to set food rations, in the sense of minimum entitlements. Now, the extent to which these things were done varied widely. In some ways, Russia was one of the least regulated of the economies. Uh, the country that made most progress in this direction was Germany. And many of the Bolshevik leaders had spent the war in exile, they'd had that opportunity to look around Europe, and were tremendously impressed by what they saw happening in Germany. So Lenin, for example, but of course it's not only Lenin, also a number of the people around Lenin have the same view. You find Lenin in March 1918 saying, German imperialism, demonstrating the greatest advance not only in military power and military technology, but also in large-scale industrial organisation, within the limits of capitalism, has signalled its economic progressiveness by implementing the move to labour conscription before other states. And then he makes this interesting point. We should do the same thing under the conditions of unbelievable post-war destruction. So, in March 1918, when Lenin was saying these things, that we need to bring in labour conscription, he was thinking a couple of things. One is, our war is over, but we still need to do this. And that raises the question then, remember the, this idea of a command economy that has one basic objective, and it's easy to understand what that basic objective is if the country is at war. But here is a country whose leaders believe that it's coming out of a war into a period of peacetime. So why does Lenin now want to bring in some of the basic features of a war economy? What is his one basic objective? And the key to this is in a number of statements that Lenin made. And after Lenin, also Stalin. That is, the world that we live in has left Russia behind the advanced capitalist countries. If we don't catch up with them, we will perish. So this is a statement about the future, not about the present. We need to catch up with the West, or we will perish. We need to overtake and outstrip the advanced countries economically. Ten years later, Stalin says, just about the identical thing, the party's task. I'm in 1927, we're in a period of peace. There are war threats, which I'll come to in a few minutes, but it's a peace time. To maintain the achieved rate of development of socialist industry and increase it in the near future, with the objective of creating the favourable conditions necessary for overtaking and outstripping the advanced capitalist countries. And most famously of all, within just a few years after that, in 1931, Stalin makes his famous speech to uh, the new generation of Soviet industrialists. One feature of the history of old Russia was the continuous beating she suffered, the falling behind for her backwardness. And then Stalin goes on to list all the countries that have defeated Russia in war. That is why we must no longer lag behind. We are 50 or 100 years behind the advanced countries, we must make good this distance in 10 years. Either we do it, or they crush us. So, you start to see here the one basic objective that was driving this economic system, which was not war in the present, but the need to prepare for future war. Lenin and Stalin after him believed we will always be either at war or anticipating war, 
the relative economic and military power of our country is decisive when there's global rivalry, and what Russia must do is catch up and overtake its rivals, of course, subject to con some constraints, as I said to you, even in wartime. People need entertainment, they need to be fed, they need to be clothed. So, this is the one main objective. It doesn't exclude subsidiary objectives, but nonetheless, this is the one main objective. And then we can see this objective working out in the two parallel stories that I mentioned. A story of foreground events, which is the advance and retreat of the economy, triumph and disaster, and there's also background processes going on at the same time, which are important if we are to understand the foreground story, which are of steady, incremental state building. Now, just to motivate this discussion a little more, I'm going to go on a little digression to talk about what e economists and economic historians mean by state capacity. If you step back from this subject and think about the world today, what we know about the world is that some countries are rich. And when you look at how they have become rich, you see that the richest countries today have grown steadily for at least two centuries. They've grown steadily. The worst period of setbacks was the period of the two world wars and in between. But nonetheless, when you draw the line those two world wars and the Great Depression, they kind of disappear. There's been this process of steady growth of the West for at least two centuries. Now, not every country is rich. Other countries are middle or low income. Typically, not because they started to grow later or not because they grew slower, but because they have grown unsteadily. Most other countries show patterns of leaps forward, then setbacks. What causes a setback is, all too often, either domestic violence or international conflict. And if you look at the world economy until the 18th century, that was pretty much the pattern everywhere. And it's still the pattern today in most places. And Russia was and arguably still is one of those places. So why is it that when you look at economic growth around the world, so often growth is reversed amid one kind of violence or another? And a key, many people argue, is state capacity. That is the capacity of the state to coerce, to tax, to administer. That's a political science definition that you can find. If you think about the Soviet Union and what was happening to state capacity in the period I'm talking to you about, it's very easy to see it in a couple of figures. In 1928, the government was using 18% of GDP, national income, for defence, for other services, for investment. By 1940, it's 48%. In just over 10 years, 30% of national income has been taken over by the state. That's state capacity. Now, one of the things that we can see in history, uh, I think we can see one of them clearer than the other, but uh, uh, let me just uh, put the argument, is that s state capacity has two thresholds. There's a lower threshold, below which you just get a disaster. Uh, when you move above the lower threshold, the state can do the things I've mentioned. It can raise revenue. It can provide basic public goods like transport and law and order. Uh, and the economy can expand. These things make it possible for the economy to grow. They don't necessarily make it possible for the state to grow in a sustained way. So there's an upper threshold which is important for sustained growth, the sort of growth that is sustained over centuries. And that is where the state becomes restrained and inclusive. Now, why does this matter so much? Um, one argument is that in a state that is restrained by the rule of law, 
it's harder for special interests to grab revenue and then fight to retain it. So a state that's inclusive leaves less room for sectional interests uh, to grab resources at the expense of others. Sorry, uh, 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 in a state that's restrained. In a state that's inclusive, it's easier to have political change. Economic and political losers, for example, don't face the fate of either killing or being killed. And in many countries, one reason that uh, parties or interest groups are reluctant to lose elections is because they fear that if they lose the election, they will lose everything. The winners will come in, expropriate them, and therefore, rather than lose the election, they will fight. So, in states that are restrained and inclusive have some kind of insurance against these risks and make it more easy to uh, organise sustained growth. And uh, Dinchaka and Katz, sorry, that's the mysterious DK. Dinchaka and Katz, uh, in an article in well, a recent economic journal, argue that a state that is inclusive and restrained not only uh, uh, has more consent, but that additional consent to its role in society gives it more capacity. So, what can go wrong? Um, one of the things that we see uh, as a happening commonly is that governments try to build the state. They know that state capacity matters. They try to build the state from the top down. And top-down state-building strategies are often self-limiting. Again, there's a paper by Asimoglu, Robinson and various co-authors very recently came out about Colombia. They give a very simple example of a state-building top-down strategy that kind of went wrong. And it goes like this. Colombia has a civil war. You want to incentivize the soldiers to kill guerrillas, guerrilla fighters. So you offer them a bonus. And the soldiers want those bonuses so what they do is they go out into the countryside and they kill people, anybody, and then they say, oh, look at the guerrillas. Give us the bonus. So this is a way of building uh, state power uh, that undermines the role of the state by undermining the rule of law. And so it's self-limiting. It means that the state can, can acquire more capacity, but it can't get above that upper threshold where the state is restrained and uh, inclusive. And you can see this very commonly around, uh, in the nature of violence around the world. In, I, I mentioned Colombia. If you think about a place like the Philippines, where there's a lot of public violence at the moment, or Islamic State, where uh, horrific violence is frequently on our screens, you can think of these as places that are trying to build state power in this top-down way. So, uh, let's think just a little bit deeper about state capacity. A moment ago I mentioned the abilities to coerce and extract and administer. But what do these abilities rest on? Here you can think that the ability to do these things rests on solving an agency problem. So, the government isn't one person that does everything on their own. The government needs agents who pursue state goals and get the citizens to go along. And in order to have that body of agents that carries out the will of the state and persuades society to go along with the will of the state, you have to do various things. The first thing is you have to have selection. You have to recruit government officials and activists, those are the people I mean by agents, and assign them to tasks. So there's selection. There's incentives, because you have to offer them incentives to focus them on those tasks. Going on from that, there's a problem of legitimacy. If you then send these agents out into society, will the citizens accept what the government's agents are telling them what to do? And here I set a very low bar for legitimacy. I don't have any sort of fancy moral definition all I mean is that the government has the minimum of legitimacy if it sends its people out and people say, 
I don't accept what you are saying, go back to Moscow, go back to London or Berlin. So there's no open challenge to the rule of the state. And then finally, there's control. Control in the, meaning, in the military sense of command and control. You issue a command, how do you know the command has been carried out? That's the control function. So how do you know that the agents are loyal? How do you know that they're getting the citizens to go along with what the state wants? Are state goals achieved as a result? You have to know these things too to solve this agency problem. Against those criteria, think about Soviet state capacity in 1917-18. At this point, it's very low. What was happening in the revolution and the civil war is the land and productive capacity, productive property, bank assets and valuables were being seized. There was a process of looting going on which Lenin acknowledged and described as looting the looters. The ruling class have looted us, now we're going to loot them. Industry and transport were being taken over by the state. Farmers' food surpluses were being seized under a so-called food dictatorship. And the outcome was a kind of economic meltdown. The supply side collapsed immediately not after a delay or gradually, but immediately. Well before the civil war got, got, got serious. And then, there's a process of civil war which comes to an end in 1920. Despite winning the civil war, the Bolsheviks faced famine and insurrection. So you can see it in the chart I showed you before. So here's 1917 and 1921. There's the collapse of the economy in 1918. It happens suddenly and abruptly. And having collapsed, the economy then stays low and gets worse till you get to 1921, which is the year of the beginning of a great famine. At this point, right, 400 is a kind of magic figure. That's the figure that Angus Madison believed that the dollars of 1990 would support someone barely for around 40 years of life on average. So $400 is the income level of some of the poorest countries in the world. And that's Russia in 1921. So that's the collapse of the economy. There's a state without capacity. If you then think of these four things, selection, incentives, legitimacy, control, selection. How are they selecting their agents? They're taking them off the street. Unemployed workers, demob demobilised soldiers, are being taken into the so-called the food armies, the blocking detachments that are going out to seize food from the peasants. So they're based partly on who the party draws in, but they're also self-selected. People coming off the street, yes, you go. Incentives. They go because they can share the loot. Uh, Paul Collier has written about the transition from grievance to greed in civil wars. You can see this very clearly at this point. The Russian Revolution may have begun out of grievance, but it quickly descends into greed. It's even explicit. Factories send detachments of workers to visit grain-producing provinces to obtain grain at fixed prices. Half the grain goes to the organisation, the rest to the state. That's explicit. Implicitly, you can think of the, the Soviet state's ambivalent attitude to corruption, which persisted through the next 70 years. You know, do we tolerate corruption? Well, it depends if it's in the good of the cause. Right? We can't always tell. Being corrupt can be dangerous for that reason. But nonetheless, corruption is semi-tolerated. Selection, incentives, legitimacy. OK, what legitimacy does this regime have? In the sense that I described, almost none. Everywhere it goes, it's challenged. It's uh, challenged openly, frequently, uh, to the point of insurrection. 
and the challenge is resolved by exemplary violence. Take a hundred people and shoot them. Shoot them where everyone can see. Sometimes it's worse than shooting. People are tortured to death in public to have a demonstrative effect on the population. Finally, control. I mean, Lenin wrote a lot about control. Lenin understood the need for control. What he talked about was control from below. And it's very hard to understand what that meant. But what it appears to have meant in practice was to incentivize uncontrolled violence. Uh, um, uh, without top-down supervision of what was being achieved. So, in that sense, you're looking at a disaster. I think there's really no doubt about it. But it's a disaster that is not without achievements. And starting from near zero, you can see under Lenin the beginning process of building up state capacity. And this is recognised by, for example, the historian Lars Lee, who writes about you know, uh, uh, bread and power in the Russian Revolution. And one of the points that he insists on is that although the Russian Revolution had many long-term destructive consequences, it did at least start to build a state. And if the state is your alternative to chaos, chaos is pretty bad too. If you think of what was being done in this time, here's a sort of selective timeline, the establishment of censorship, the establishment of the secret police, the Red Army, 1917-18, the one-party state. So these are things that create the capacity of the government to coerce opinion and to coerce enemies. In the economy, there's a ministry of industry, the Glavki, the chief committees of the different branches of industry, 1921, as the Civil War comes to an end, Gosplan. What's the job of Gosplan? Is to control the supply chain. Now, again, 1921, a ban on party factions. So this is damping down the level of disagreement and challenge in society. By 1921, the Bolsheviks had done enough to survive. But they had not found a reliable solution uh, to the agency problem. So we turn to the next stage. In 1921, Lenin announced a breathing space. There was a short delay before people could breathe again because there was now a process of famine and hyperinflation. Tens of millions of people suffered, millions died. But after that, the economy recovered. There was relative normality. So a mixed economy, private enterprise had its sphere, Peasant farmers could re-engage with trade. There's a lot of state oversight. Remember that word, control. And the outcomes were a recovery, uh, which slowed down before the pre-war levels of output were regained. There's inflationary pressure, which is driven by state plans to invest in industry. And as early as 1926, you get the first signs of a grain shortage recurring. Here's the picture. Here's 1921. There's the recovery. 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26. The recovery starts to disappear. 1929. Now... From 1922, Lenin was essentially out of politics. His place was increasingly taken by Stalin. And there's more state capacity building. And Stalin is very closely, personally associated with these things. There's a centralisation of censorship. So until 1922, there is a censorship, but it's scattered. There's no one censor. From 1922, there's one censor. The secret police ceases just to be uh, an organisation of people riding out to punish the peasants, and becomes the chief political administration of the Ministry of the Interior. Stalin creates an institution known as the Nomenklatura. This is the list of party posts, the, sorry, the, the list of post, government posts to which, for which party 
approval is required, and the party members that can fill them. It creates a personnel system for the Soviet regime. And then there's a little gap, but by 1928 you have a further innovation, which is of crucial importance, which is the elimination of leadership rivalry. Stalin surrounds himself by people who are personally dedicated to him. So until then, there's leadership ri rivals and disputes, all of which cast doubt on the legitimacy of the one true line of the party. But from 1928, that's no longer the case. So the agency problem is being solved. Selection. There's a centralised register, which eventually in includes tens of thousands of party members, with their records. How good are they at what we give them to do? Do they perform well? Can we trust them? Incentives. So the incentive for doing what the party wants is no longer getting your share of what can be stolen. It's now the prospect of a career, of personal advancement over years and decades to come. There's legitimacy, because there's no more debate, there are no more inconvenient truths. There's a single party line, a single leadership, and there's no more exemplary public violence. That's the sign that they succeeded. And then control. And this is real control now. This is audit functions uh, in every workplace. Audit functions that include planning, statistics, secret communication, the security police in a position to surveil the workforce and to know who is being employed and what they are doing. Meanwhile, Stalin continues to worry about future war. Remember, the one main objective. The Soviet Union was surrounded by unfriendly neighbours. There were repeated war alarms. And each war alarm gave Stalin new information, not so much about war in the present, because these were just alarms. They were just scares. But every time there was a war scare, the military gave Stalin information. They said, look, if we actually need to fight a war, we are going to need thousands of airplanes and tanks that we do not have, that we cannot yet produce. The secret police also gave Stalin information every time this happened. They said, listen to what the people are saying. The people are saying that if there's a war, we will get guns and we will not turn them on the enemy, we will turn them on the communists. And the third prediction was really one that anyone could make from recent history, which is, when there's a war, it gives the foreign enemy a chance to incite revolution. Because this is what the Bolsheviks did in 1917, and it can be done to the Bolsheviks the next time there is a war. So Stalin was attentive to all these warnings, and in 1929 he returned to this one basic objective with the five-year plan, 600 large-scale capital projects, a system of administrative priorities to support them, the control of supply chains, control of the food supply through the collectivization of agriculture, and also rearmament. Not quick rearmament, but slow rearmament, based on building up the engineering industry, the coal and metallurgical industries, uh, the power system, and so on, power and transport. Now, greater state capacity did not solve all problems. And in 1932, we have a new famine. Six and a half million people died. Just like in 1921, well, yes and no. And I think the differences are as important as the similarities. So you can think of it like this. We have two famines, one in 1921, one in 1932. Each famine had a trigger, an underlying cause, a number of victims. Did the people know about it? Were the victims helped? What was the economic situation? And how did policy change? So in 1921, the trigger was a harvest failure. The, you know, it was a bad year. But it came on the top of several years of disastrous food policies that took grain from the peasantry and, and uh, destroyed the incentive to produce food. There were five million victims. Awareness was worldwide. There was a global 
a relief program organized by the Red Cross and the American Relief Administration. The context was one of economic collapse and it was associated with a major U-turn in economic policy, away from a command system to the new economic policy. What happens in 1932? Some of these things are the same. There was a harvest failure, but in the background were food policies, the seizure of food from the peasants. Six and a half million people died. But then the difference is, it was secret. When I was a student in the, uh, I began to study the subject in the late 60s, we debated among ourselves, was there a famine? Some people talk about it, but we don't really know. It was, a, it was a, a matter of debate, of speculation. At the time, there was a total blackout. There was very limited, secret, small-scale assistance to famine victims, only after it was much too late. The situation in the economy was a temporary slowdown. Did policy change? Yes, in small ways. But in big ways, persistence with the programme. And you can see this. If you look at the chart, here's 1921, the culmination of the disaster of the Civil War period. Here's 1932. You can see there's a little slowdown here. But the reason it's only a little slowdown is because industry is forging ahead. And after 1932, there's a recovery, which shows several years of uninterrupted growth. Now, one of the, I think one of the interesting things about this chart is it shows that if you compare 1913 and 19, let's say 39, almost all the growth between those years happened in a very short time, really between sort of 1933 and 1937. All the interwar growth happened in those five years. So there was recovery, Many of those big capital projects were completed, of course, after huge efforts, often after long delays, often with much pointless waste of life, but nonetheless, they were completed. In 1936, there was another harvest failure on the same scale as 1932, but no famine. It was managed without incident. And again, you can see here the difference that growing state capacity made. In 1937, economic growth stopped again. It was interrupted by the Great Terror, the mass killing of potential enemies, and followed by rearmament, intensified rearmament against Germany and Japan. Remember all those planes. So the difference that state capacity made, one of the things you can think about is regime violence. What happened to regime violence? Actually, the quantity of regime violence increased. So if you look at executions year by year from 1921 to 1940, here's the averages. You can see two peaks. There's a, a, peak, a little peak of executions in 1930 to 31. So this is collectivization, the intensification of effort for the first five-year plan. And it falls back. And then here's the Great Terror. Uh, you know, in... Uh, a few months, uh, more than three-quarters of a million people are executed. Um, but the quality of violence changes as well. So 